All right, so good morning, good afternoon. We've got a continent-wide audience today. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got some familiar faces in the crowd today, but if you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. A huge welcome to all our teachers back again. We've been putting out newsletter after newsletter the last few weeks because we have like 50 programs in the next 20 days. It's insane. So if you want to sign up, there's lots on the go. Everything from quantum physics to babies and ocean wise to amazing photography today and so much more. Really excited to have you join us on the journey as we get to showcase and celebrate such amazing people and places around the globe. Now, earlier this year, I got the chance to hang out with and talk with Tamara Blasquez. And she is a award winning, fantastic nature photographer who uses her work to tell stories about wildlife to help conserve uh, animals around the globe, which is a uh, uh, subject near and dear to my own heart, and specifically and almost uniquely to showcase the amazing wildlife that's found in cities. A lot of our teachers will know we've got Backyard Bio coming up in just a few weeks all May long, all about getting kids out exploring their local wildlife near them to find. And I'm so excited today to feature from an expert's perspective just how incredible the wildlife in a major urban center like Mexico City can be. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome in Tamara. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Welcome to your first proper Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants extravaganza. It's so nice to have you today. Thank you, Jesse. It's an honor to be here today with all of you. I'm very excited. I'm very excited, too. I know you've got a lot of beautiful, beautiful pictures to share with us. If you want to go full screen and dive in, let's do this thing. Perfect. Okay, so is it showing all right? Oh, yeah, you're perfect. Okay, so thank you all for being here today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how photography can be used for wildlife and nature conservation. So uh, most of my work is focused on taking pretty pictures of pretty animals or maybe not so not such pretty animals because you know many people tend to think that some animals are ugly and they kill them or they hurt them in many ways. For example, as Jesse was saying, here in Mexico City, one of the most common species that can be seen all around this huge, huge city is the opossum, which is the little animal that you're seeing on your screen right now. But many people think that this little animal is ugly or they confuse them with rats and hence they hurt them. But through photography, what I'm trying to do is to show them that these animals, maybe they are not as beautiful as say an elephant or a lion, but they are still cute and of course they are very important for the environment and even more so for an urban environment which is already pretty fragile so we need to take care of them so by snapping pretty pictures of these animals i try to raise a little bit of empathy and awareness in people and maybe get them to care a little bit more about our urban neighbors but I also focus, you know, on the most um, extravagant or exotic wildlife that can be found around my country, uh, which is Mexico and other countries as well, um, especially those that can be also very scary and that are also susceptible to being hurt by people. So I try to showcase their beauty so that people get interested in learning about them and so that we can all uh, fight for their conservation. But I also try to showcase the damage that we are doing to our beautiful nature because uh, conservation photography or using photography for wildlife and nature conservation is all about telling stories. It's all about letting people know what is happening out there. And by out there, I don't mean um, in the Amazon rainforest, which is very important, but I mean what is happening in our own communities so that people can understand that nature devastation is actually going on in our local parks, in our local forests, local wetlands, and that's where they can actually jump in and create some change. That's how we can actually protect nature, by focusing on our local environments that are being sadly hurt or destroyed. Uh, so this is a photograph of a wetland here in Mexico City, a very important wetland, that sadly a highway was built on top of that. Uh, and many people don't know about this area or how important this area is and why the building of the bridge, of the vehicular br bridge, was such an ecocide and something really terrible for the government to do and the reason for this is that this wetland was home to more than 200 species of birds and endemic and endangered species like the famous ashalotl that has been you know it has taken like a tour around the globe it's a very very famous species you know this little pink salamander it lives there so building something like this on top of its ecosystem is 
actually pretty heinous and it's um it endangers the species even more so through photography we tried as conservation photographers we try to showcase this to the public so that they can know what is happening in the world and how they can help in wildlife conservation and as jesse was saying i have also been using my photography to teach kids and teenagers and the regular population about the urban wildlife residing in mexico city so um this is like a twist from storytelling and i have been using my photography to document all the species or or a lot of the species that live here i don't think i'll be able to document every single species living in mexico city because there are more than two thousand species living here it's a lot, <laughs> but I try to document as many as I can. And then I bring these photographs to schools, to different venues and different places. And we chat about species. Uh, I'm trying to make science a lot more fun, a lot more accessible to the regular population because, you know, um, scientific papers can be a little bit tedious, maybe even boring if you don't know a lot about science. So by combining science with photography and with different kinds of activities like um, uh, workshops, talks, playing with stuffed animals and such, we can all learn in a more um, efficient way about how to preserve these species and their ec ecosystems, even in urban settings like Mexico City. So this is one of the of the exhibitions I held right before the pandemic. It's actually with university students. These students were all of them were studying biology, and even as future bi future biologists, they didn't really know all of the species that resided in our city, even though they were studying here in, in Mexico City. So it's important to always share knowledge, make knowledge accessible to everyone, to anyone that wants to learn. And photography makes it a lot easier for people to get interested in different kinds of topics. And you know, as a wildlife and conservation photographer, I travel to many different places. Here are some photos of me in action. Um, it's like a very romanticized profession because you get to be in nature, you get to dress up, to camouflage, to hide from wildlife, you get to climb rocks, you get to go inside rivers and such, searching for the animals. It can also be dangerous, but it is very, it's amazing. I mean, it's a really fun experience. And the most important part of it is that while going on assignment or, or on adventures to photograph these species, you end up learning a lot, not only about the animals that you want to photograph and not only about the nature that you're also photographing, but also about the people that are fighting to protect these species. About uh, You learn from uh, local people, you learn a lot about different customs, different cultures. So it's pretty neat. It's really, uh, it's helping me grow a lot as a person also, you know, because it changes a lot of your paradigm and the way that you see the world. And I also try to take photos of pretty landscapes because it's important for people to get to know what is out there, as I was telling you before. This shot is actually a shot of Mexico City, of this important wetland. And, you know, when you talk about cities, people only think about buildings and cars and pollution and garbage. But when you show these kinds of photographs, you can open people's minds and get them to realize that nature is always here with us. And it is very important for us to protect it because nature gives us life. For example, this wetland actually provides a lot of the population in Mexico City with clean water, with drinking water. And it's also a place where a lot of the food that we eat, like tomatoes, like spinach, carrots, all these kinds of crops are grown here, right in, in the southern part of the city. So people need to, to know about this and photography can help us get this information out there because even when you live in a certain place or a certain community, maybe you'll never be able to visit a specific area, maybe because of school or because of work or because of several issues. And that's a little bit sad, of course, but through photography, we can bring all these places <clears throat> closer to the people. So it's, it's an art, but it's very important to science, to conservation, and to our daily life. Without beautiful images, I think things would be very depressing or even more depressing than how things are already. So, for example, this is a photo of the axolotl, the, the little salamander that I was telling you about. The most commercial um, images of this animal portray it as being pink. 
that's like the domesticated version of the species. The species is actually kind of brown. So it's a very ind endangered species because this wetland, which is called Xochimilco, is about to disappear because of the urbanization from pollution and from just the government not caring about it. So um, many people don't really know the species or how important it is. And through photography, we can teach people about it. Uh, we can also sh showcase the beauty of animals, as I was telling you before, that many people don't consider beautiful. But through photography, we can highlight uh, details in their faces, in their skins, in their eyes, and make people get a little more interested about, for example, amphibians. Amphibians are very important for nature and for the ecosystem, but they are despised by many because they think they are gross. So through a beautiful image, you can show them that amphibians are not gross, that they are actually pretty cute, that they have funny looking faces, that they have very interesting colors and patterns. And you can establish a dialogue with your audience about how it's important, how important it is to protect them. Uh, because, you know, sometimes when you are trying to do a, what is called environmental education, which is talking about the environment, the species, etc. Um, people are are already a bit closed off to the information because of their prejudice. So through these pretty images, you can kind of break into those prejudices, you know, break down those barriers, and help them be a little bit more open to receiving information on the species. And you can only achieve that through images. And that is because as, as human beings, we are very visual animals because we are also animals. And we like photos, we like art, we like pictures. So pretty pictures can really uh, tell a thousand words, you know, as cliched as that might sound. It's a universal language and it can help us establish different kinds of relationships with different kinds of people. And you know, a pretty picture will always catch the eye of your audience. For example, if you want to talk about hummingbirds and pollination, well, a pretty picture of a hummingbird is going to do most of the work on its own and make it easier for you when you're trying to educate your audience about them. And for example, here in Mexico City, you can also find a lot of native bees. Uh, native bees like this one, this is a mining bee, are not as pretty as the most commercial European bee, you know, the one that is yellow with black stripes. And people no, tend to kill these bees because they kind of look like wasps, so they think that might be dangerous. Uh, but, you know, through a pretty image, you can uh, break through those prejudices and start talking about why native bees are important pollinators as well and that you should not squash them every time you meet with them. And showing how um, they work and combining these animals with a pretty picture of a flower, with pretty colors, all that is what makes it attractive for people to want to learn about it. Because you catch their eye, you can establish a dialogue. And even through uh, social media, even if you are not speaking to them in person, a beautiful image can catch their eye, can tell a story, and can actually make a change in the world. Um, this is a photograph of a ringtail cat which is also an urban species. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. <clears throat> this is an urban species that also lives here in Mexico City. And I actually took this photograph in my backyard during the pandemic. Um, this animal is nocturnal 100% and is very resilient. It has adapted really well to the urban environment. And it kind of looks like a combination between a cat and a raccoon. You cannot see it here, but its tail is really long and it has rings on it just like like the, the, the tail of a raccoon or like a lemur. And the, the ring-tailed cat is a cousin to the raccoon. It's very, it's very smart, it's a very smart animal and it's sadly also endangered in Mexico. You can also find this species in the southern part of the United States. It's not endangered over there, but it is here in my country sadly because of different kinds of issues, especially urbanization. So through my photography, I'm also trying to showcase how these animals are surviving in such a huge city. Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world and one of the most populated ones. So people really, when you talk about wildlife in the city, they just cannot imagine wildlife in the city. So through my work, I am trying to help them uh, get a grasp of what is happening with our wild neighbors. And, you know, I don't only focus on the pretty portraits, so I'm also trying to showcase 
their whole environment. So to make it easier for people to understand um, a little bit about the hill, the hidden lives, so to speak, of these animals. And also one of the best things about photography, as I was telling you before, is how it can change paradigms. This is a photograph of a griffon vulture that I photographed in Spain around five years ago. And you probably know this, but vultures are reviled by society. They are just, no one likes vultures. I love them, but most people don't like them because the media and almost all the literature out there has portrayed vultures as evil animals because they eat carrion, because they feed off of dead animals. They are always covered in blood and very gory and violent images have been distributed about these animals. But these birds are actually very important for the environment because they eat carrion. Let's say that they are the ones that are recycling all this organic matter and without them, all these dead animals like cattle, uh, zebras, whatever you may think, would decompose in the open air and a lot of, of illnesses would invade our planet. I mean, even more so than it is right now that we are being faced, well, we got faced with the pandemic and many other illnesses are starting to come up as well due to nature devastation. So for example, without the vultures, and without any other uh, animal that it's carrion, like hyenas, for example, we would have a lot more of diseases going around the world because this, these dead bodies would decompose and you know a lot of bacteria would be out in the open. So they are helping us keep um, a healthy planet, to have a healthy planet, and still we kill them. They are being, vultures are being poisoned in great numbers and they are sadly going extinct. And in some countries, some African countries, and even others like India, Pakistan, where vultures are being killed mercilessly, uh, there, there are a lot of illnesses of diseases that are, are starting to come up again, like anthrax, Ebola, and botulism also, diseases that we thought were already controlled or eradicated. They were controlled because of these animals, not only because of human action, and by hurting these species, we are in turn hurting ourselves. So I am very proud of this photograph, not only because I captured the vulture mid-flight. Um, this photograph won the 2019 National Geographic Travel Photo Contest in the nature category, uh, not only because it was a good photo, but because of the expression in the vulture's face, which that's when, when I reviewed my photo after taking it, I saw the expression on the bird's eyes. And as you can see, it's not evil. It's not an evil expression. You don't see any malice on, on its eyes. You don't see anything other than tenderness. So the photo is actually titled Tender Eyes. And what I wanted with this shot is to show people that vultures are beautiful birds in their own way. Maybe they are not beautiful as a hummingbird, but they are beautiful in different ways and they are important and they are not evil. So through through our photographs, through our different kinds of images, by uh, showing the, uh, the faces, the, the expressions of animals, by capturing their eyes, their true essence, we can raise awareness in people and we can also make them feel a little bit of empathy towards these species and help them look at them in a different light so that they can stop hurting them or that their so that their prejudices can, you know, go away or start disappearing little by little <clears throat> and you know birds are animals that are hated by some and they are loved by others so uh, snapping pretty pictures of them they can we can help educate the audience and we can also help them understand uh, we can help people understand these animals a lot better you know uh, i like to focus a lot on the faces and the expressions of animals uh, maybe that's not very scientific, but we are, as human beings, we are also very emotional. So I think that the way to help people change their views in nature is through emotion, through the heart. So uh, it's very important for me to capture the eyes of the animals, their expressions, their souls, so to speak, so that people can connect with them. And I also try to do a little bit of more artistic images also when I am telling a story. For example, this is a photo of an American bison, which um, is a species that is endangered. Um, and here in Mexico, it, it actually went extinct 
for a while, for a pretty long while, because they were hunted down, because their environment was destroyed. And um, right now there is a national program which is trying to bring them back from extinction. So they are looking for different kinds of herds that were kept in ranches or in that were maybe secluded in the mountains or in forests or in different kinds of prairies uh, in northern Mexico. And they are trying to reproduce them and to uh, get them back into the wild. And so this photo, actually, uh, I took this one in a very, very sunny day. And the bison was standing in, in a place where there was a lot of shade. But the sun kind of like made this kind of a rim around the animal. And what I liked is that for me, when I when I reviewed this photo, I felt like um, this gentle giant was telling me something like, we were forsaken for such a long time, but now we are coming back. So I tried to get shots that tell something like that, like a story, like an emotion that evokes something to my audience. So this photograph is actually uh, titled Forsaken Giants because of that, because they were forsaken by the Mexican government and the people for the longest time. And the environment was also suffering from the absence of this herbivore because of how they held prairies and, you know, all this cycle around them. And um, I'm also trying to raise awareness with the story of these animals and how it's important to conserve um, such species and to try to think about them as important individuals and go beyond just thinking that, yeah, they are like cows, so we can hunt them down and eat them. Well, there's you know they are more important than that so i want i want to evoke those kinds of feelings in people you know so that they can feel a little bit more of empathy toward the species but of course as i was telling you before uh, showcasing the beauty of nature is very important because we need to to see how beautiful our world is how beautiful the animals that we share this world are and not only to want to conserve and protect them, but because for mental health, it's also important. Nature actually helps us fight depression. It calms us down, so it can also help us uh, fight anxiety and other mental issues like stress and whatnot. So beautiful images of beautiful nature are very good for our health as well. So I also try to provide my audience with these kinds of images. And I try to um, use different kinds of techniques to capture birds in flight, everything that can also help people realize um, or understand how these animals live. And also, uh, as I was telling you before, uh, showcasing the hidden lives of nature or the hidden species in our planet or species that we don't really know about that is one of the main focuses of my work. This is the Hispaniolan solanodon. It's a species that only can only be found in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and in no other place in the world. This little mammal that resembles a shrew is actually, along with the platypus, uh, the other venomous mammal on the planet. And what is very, what's very special about this species is that, that, is that this little animal walked alongside the dinosaurs. And it hasn't evolved in like 60 million years. So scientists are very fascinated about these species. And the problem with these species, it, it's that um, it's very dependent on the forests it lives in, in the, Rom the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And sadly, uh, both countries are, uh, they are being faced with a lot of deforestation due to urbanization and tourism. And so um, they are, um, they are not endangered right now because a lot of people have been fighting for them to be protected. They were highly endangered uh, 30 years ago, uh, but now they are a little bit more protected. But still, the work is not done. And what can help the conservationists that are fighting for this species uh, to succeed in their work is for people to know about them, to know about the species, to know about the stories around these species and the threats that they are facing. So photography, again, helps us get these stories, get these species out into the world without actually capturing the species and getting get it to travel all around the world as if it was in a circus or something like that. So, you know, it's a, a, a lot more environmentally friendly to just snap a pretty photo of an animal and have that tour the whole world instead of capturing the poor guy and having, you know, go around the globe against its will. 
So photography has really taken this um, very important role in science and conservation for the last like three decades or so. And as and in the same manner, showcasing how animals are also uh, fighting against urbanization, how they are adapting to live in places even where, where there's trash and stuff like that is also very important. It can also inspire uh, governments and such to take action towards uh, the protection of said species and said environments, especially in urban settings. Really, um, the reason why many cities in the world have not collapsed yet is because of wildlife. <clears throat> because wildlife keep the the urban ecosystems or, or whatever little nature is left in different kinds of urban settings, wildlife is what keeps these natural areas healthy. They are the ones that pollinate flowers, they are the ones that uh, spread seeds, they control other populations and avoid, um, I don't know, in, some insects turning into plagues, into pests, etc. So it's thanks to wildlife that <laughs> ecosystems can function and that in turn that we as humans can benefit from said ecosystems and that our cities, cities are not collapsing. So it's very important to help in any way we can uh, to protect them. And as I was telling you before, uh, connecting with my audience is very important. I also like to tell the stories of animals that have been taken to zoos. Uh, zoos are a very controversial subject. Uh, some zoos are really good in conservation. Some zoos are doing amazing work for wildlife. Here in Mexico City, for example, zoos are doing the entire opposite. They are not helping wildlife. They are actually uh, in the middle of different scandals because uh, they have let um, so many animals in their care have died due to negligence. Actually, this orangutan is one of them. His name was Toto. He was um, His birth was actually an accident because due to the negligence of the staff, two different subspecies of orangutans made it and he was born. He was a hybrid. So he would never had been able to be released back into the wild. He would have never had survived. And actually, he was uh, raised by humans. So he didn't really know how to be an orangutan. As you can see, his fur is was matted. You know, it's there are dreadlocks in his fur because he didn't even know how to groom himself. So he spent all his 30 years of life in, inside a cage. As you can see, you can see the bars uh, in the background of the image because the enclosure was concrete, it was horrible. And what I liked about this photo is that you can see in his eyes that he's just not, he's just not happy. He's, he, he was sad, he was maybe even depressed. I mean, I'm not an expert on primates, but... And what I want to, to show with these photos is that um, we can do so much good for wildlife, but we can also do so much harm to them and uh, that we are not separate from them, that we, that animals and we as humans, we share certain emotions, that we share personalities, we share uh, certain needs. Um, and I want people to, to realize about this and to stop looking at animals as objects and actually see them as our peers in this amazing planet. And photography is a great tool for that because as i was telling you you can just focus on the eyes and those eyes on their own are telling a whole story you don't need anything else but the the look in the animal's eyes to tell a story and to connect to people so photography becomes a very very powerful tool for wildlife conservation uh, and again you know it takes a lot of practice to get <laughs> To this kind of level of photography that you can connect that you can show birds in flight that you can show all their colors or all their magnificence and beauty but uh, if you're interested in photography and in art and science and conservation i really recommend that you step into this amazing world because it helps you i mean it may sound cliched but it really helps you look out into the world in a different way you start to notice the little details you start to notice the little guys that share our planet with us and you start um you start to help maybe it doesn't really seem like it but through your photographs through showcasing the beauty of animals uh, showcasing uh, the damage that we are also doing to our planet, you can plant little seeds in your audience, little by little. And, you know, um, I'll never get over the fact of how people get really amazed when looking at photographs, especially those about urban wildlife. 
<laughs> it's like uh, they get to be little children again, especially when it's adults. You know, they get so so amazed by the beauty of our planet and that's what we need to to never forget because when we grow up as adults we get so caught up in work in paying the bills the taxes everything like that that we forget about the wonderful planet that we live in and as photographers i think it's our job to remind people of all ages of all demographics about the beauty of our planet about the beauty that we are missing out for being chained to a computer in a desk in an office all day long so our mission as photographers is also to bring you the to bring the world to you to your screen to your computer to help you get relaxed to help you get educated and informed and to remind you of how beautiful our planet is and how it is worth protecting it and saving it so that would be all on my part. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, this is a photo of, of the ringtail cat. You can actually see how cute its little face is. And well, I hope you like the presentation and the photos. Thank you. Tamara, thank you so much for that. What an extraordinary uh, bunch of beautiful photographs. And what a great message for our students, whether they want to go into thank photography you. or they just love wildlife. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so, so thank much. You. Um, I will note too, and this is on the final slide, but if you want to check out Tamara's website on Instagram, she has different handles for all her social media pages, but they are all linked into her website if you want to check mm -hmm. out even more when you're done the broadcast. Now, uh, Tamara, I'm going to go to Miss Crow's class, Miss Brown, Miss Camog's group. Uh, if you guys want to all unmute your mics and you're in the background, I can't hear you. And we'll dive in with questions with Miss Crow's class first in just a second. But to begin, Tamara, is there a favorite for, for someone who is exploring their own city for the first time? Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to go out and find local wildlife. Are there any tips or tricks? Are there places within cities that tend to be the best for finding wildlife in your experience or anything you can share with us? Yeah, of course. Uh, some of the best things that you can do is go to your local park. You are going to see, firstly, a lot of birds, probably a lot of species that you didn't know about, maybe a squirrel. And if you stay there for quite some while and maybe start going some days, you go in the morning, other days you go late in the afternoon, you are going to run into different kinds of animals that you maybe have never seen before. And even in your own backyard, if you pay close attention and just sit there and wait, nature is going to come to you and you're going to be really surprised you can also use tools like google or maybe visit your local library or your local college and start asking around about any kind of wildlife that have maybe that was documented before maybe there are some brochures or some resources but you know any place in your city with a lot of trees a lot of nature you're going to find something Amazing. I would really encourage our classes too, and we highlight this in our backyard bio. The Seek app is incredible. If you download this, it's free. You type in your city, it will show you the most commonly seen wildlife as found by people just like you anywhere. Uh, when I was 10, I went into my backyard with a magnifying glass and a sketch oh, pad, and I found 72 species. 72 wow. in my backyard in two hours. So there's, and that's in Toronto. I mean, that's a pretty major city. So uh, it is just worth highlighting for all our kids. There's always stuff to find. Thank you. Exactly. So yeah. Totally correct. Class, we're going to head to Flesherton for our remote class. I hope the connection is still working, but it, you can unmute your mic and you're good to go if you have any questions for us. Let's see, Miss Crow. Should be good to go. Got to unmute though. Wants to work. Thinking about it. I'll come back. Miss Brown, same deal. Please do unmute, but I'll head to our Oregon Family School first, but you guys are right at the camera. So if you guys want to unmute, you're good to go. Hi. Hi, that was so Hi. awesome. We were, the whole class was tuned in. We loved it. Um, my question to you is, uh, a lot of our students here have just iPads. We, you know, hmm. that's what we're using to take photography, to take photos. We don't have the camera gear. And yeah. it's, a, it's from what I've, gathered it's a pretty different kind of process um can you tell me um have you ever taken photos like professional photos with that kind of equipment and if so do you have any tips yes of course ipads or your cell phone are a great tool to get started in photography and you know nowadays they have amazing technology for photographs especially for little animals like butterflies insects and such so um what you can do um maybe you cannot get really close uh, to a big animal with an ipad 
uh, but do a lands landscape shot, you know, the, the whole shot with the landscape and the animal. And that's actually sometimes going to be a lot more valuable and more much more educational uh, for your audience because you are showcasing the whole environment with the individual than just taking a closed up portrait. So don't be intimidated if you don't have a long lens, if you don't have a professional camera, just go out there with your cell phone, with your iPad and start taking the photos of anything and everything that catches your eye. And I'm sure you're going to come up with beautiful, beautiful imagery that it's going to be very valuable and very educational for yourself and for your family, your friends, your audience, your social media. So yeah, go for it. Nice. I We had uh, Lise Carrera on. She's an explorer, a National Geographic educator, and she used an iPhone for like everything she did for an entire year. The last time I went on a trip, I had this, which is a great <laughs> camera, and yeah. my wife's iPhone, like, destroyed it like it was, all the pictures were so much better this is really good for something really far off if i wanted a really close up but otherwise it's amazing how much camera technology has improved in the last mm -hmm. like, decade it's just unbelievable so i'm really exactly. glad to question. thanks janice um live classes feel free to share questions don't uh be shy you can unmute your mics and i'll come back uh to everyone in a minute tamara mm -hmm. we get this question every time we got it in an email is there a favorite animal you've ever photographed or one that was particularly charismatic that you loved? It could be an ugly animal, it could be, <laughs> serve, it could be anything that was your all-time favorite. <laughs> well, actually, one of my all-time favorites was the, the ring-tailed cat, the one that I showed you, uh, because during the pandemic, I actually first discovered it uh, while looking outside my kitchen window. One night, I saw it coming into the backyard, and I was like, oh, look at that what is it doing here so i started observing it every day and every night the ringtail cat would come into my yard at exactly 8 p.m you know very very punctual animal yeah animals are creatures of habit so they tend to follow schedules so after a while i set up my camera and i read a lot about them to try and understand a little a little bit more about their behavior and you know it took me two months to take a, a nice photo of it but it was worth it. And after snapping my photograph, I was trying to push it a little bit and said, maybe I can get another shot of this little guy. And I set up my camera. I was hiding, you know, under a camouflage blanket. And I saw it coming towards me on the camera, but then it suddenly disappeared. And I was like, what just happened? And yeah. I turned to my right and there it was staring at me like, Hello, human. What are you doing? I already know that you are there. So <laughs> that was for me, it was an amazing moment because it made me realize how smart wildlife actually is and how difficult to trick them it is, you know, because you can you can think that you're really well hidden, but they smell you. They they find you. They know. Yeah, they know. <laughs> yeah. We've been, uh, my wife and I, it's my birthday tomorrow. And so my, uh, oh, for my birthday gift. Thank you very much. So in the mail, I got my my classic birthday gift every year is all the BBC series. So I have the Green Ooh. Planet, I have Frozen Planet 2, and they all end with this 10-minute featurette showing wildlife photographers in the most harrowing conditions for spending weeks on end trying to find this incredible shot. They get the one shot. They're so yes. thrilled. It's always on the last day of filming that they get the shot. Yeah. So I'm so curious. Could you explain sort of the role of patience in general in getting nature photography? Because it's great when the cat shows up in your backyard at 8 mm -hmm. p.m. every day. But for people that wanted to even do something, even not professionally, how important is it to be still and relaxed and wait for something to come? <laughs> oh, that's key. It's fundamental to have a lot of patience. And um, the good thing about this profession is that you also develop a lot of um, tolerance for frustration because what I like to tell my students when I also teach photography workshops is that you as the photographer, you are not the one that is going to decide if you get the photo or not. It's the animal. <laughs> you are just going to go there. I mean, you do have to study a lot about the species beforehand so that you can know where to look for it, at what time of day it's easier to find them, to know about their habits, etc. But in the end, I mean, you can sit in a park under a tree uh, next to a bush of flowers waiting for a hummingbird to come and fly over and take the photo. Um, and you can sit there for hours. And if the hummingbird just does not want to feed up those flowers that day, then you are not going to get your shot, no matter what you do. So you have to be a lot, uh, to be very patient and to learn to be like in this Zen mode in nature. Maybe just sit there, start meditating, listen to the sounds, not make any sound yourself. And you may need to go back to that same spot for weeks, months even. But if Eventually, if you are patient enough, 
you will be rewarded with your shot because also animals start to get used to your presence. So yeah. at first they are going to be a little bit scared of you because to animals we are predators, sadly. So after a while, when they see you going there day after day after day and that you are not doing anything, that you're not even moving, that you are not hurting, you're not even hurting the flowers, they are going to see, oh, so this human is not, is not a threat. I can show myself and you will get your shot. I have a bunch of ducks in the pond nearby my house. And oh. when I started walking in the summer, they would fly away from 100 feet away. <laughs> yeah. Now they're like, ah, eh, eh, it's winter. We don't want to get up. They're like two feet from you. And they're just like, okay, you're there. Yes. But I, I'm so glad you mentioned this. And it's so important to find joy in all those moments waiting mm -hmm. as well. We've had astronauts on. And most astronauts will never go to space. So if you're going to, <laughs> because you want to go to space, if you go into nature photography because, oh, day one, I'm going to get the best shot. Oh, no. How it works and so it's so important to find all these other aspects of, of making it a really special experience and i'm so glad exactly you that. yeah <laughs> um, no miss brown miss crow you guys can email me if you have any other questions after the fact uh you're like oh miss brown you got your mic on now good i'll come to you first and then miss cabahog will come to you to wrap up in just a second but come on in in georgia guys mm -hmm. hi we just had a question about how how old are you or how young were you i guess when you got started <laughs> in photography yeah. And what was your main motivation for wanting to do wildlife photography? Fantastic question. Oh, great answer. Well, right now I am 33 years old. Um, I started in photography when I was really little, actually. Uh, when I was six years old, my father gifted me one of those instant Polaroid cameras. And I just fell in love with photography. I also had the fortune of growing up surrounded with magazines like National Geographic, Time Magazine, and watching all the documentaries that Jesse mentioned from the BBC, Discovery Channel. And I was very inspired, you know, yeah, by the work of all these photographers, videographers, filmmakers, doing so much for nature through these stories. And when I turned 18 years old, I said, that's what I want to do with my life. I love photography. I love nature. I love wildlife. I want to help them in any possible way that I can. I want to inspire people to fight for our planet just as I was inspired in doing so. So um, when I finished high school, all my college education and everything was into photography. I studied photography. Then I volunteered in a zoo uh, to learn about biology, ecology, conservation. I have taken many courses on the matter. And um, I have been doing photography for the last uh, 12 to 13 years, if we count the, the time where, when I was still starting the career. And professionally, I've been doing wildlife and conservation photography for the last eight years, more or less. Yeah. Fantastic. And by the way, I want to note for our classes, whether you're in Georgia, Ontario, Oregon, you don't need to buy these things. You can go to your local library and get all the National Geographic, all the nature things, any BBC series like these things are accessible to you no matter where you are in Canada, the U.S. or beyond. Oh. Uh, and so it's so important to take that opportunity, learn, to discover. It's a really exciting world out there. And of course, all are exploring by the seat of your pants programs, too. Let's not forget <laughs> those up on YouTube. Um, speaking of Ben, we're going to go to Oregon for one final question. If you guys want to wrap up. Come on in, unmute, and you're good to go. Hey. Okay. Hi again. Uh, two questions. The first one is, did you also major in science? And then the second question I um, that we had was, um, can you tell us about an experience that might have been a little bit dangerous or scary for you when you were out in nature? Sure. Great questions. Uh, no, I did not major in science. I majored in photography, but as I was telling you, I have been studying on my own and taking courses in different universities around the world and learning from the best scientists in my country for the last decade. So um, a friend of mine, one of my mentors, which is a biology, once told me that I may not be officially a biologist, but I am a biologist in my heart. So that meant a lot. Um, and as Jesse was telling you, you can learn a lot about nature um, and wildlife if you maybe science is not your cup of tea and you do not want to major in it, but you still want to learn. Well, nowadays there are a lot of resources in libraries and on the internet that you can learn a lot about science and, you know, get educated on your own, which is also valid, I think. And um, yeah, actually, one of the scariest experiences I had was last summer. I was documenting the illegal logging in one of the forests here in Mexico City. And, you know, this is this is the part when conservation and wildlife photography turns dangerous because you have to cover stories that feature, so to speak, uh, the organized crime. 
So the illegal logging here in Mexico City is highly related to drug dealing and stuff like that. So when we got into the forest, we were met with gunshots from the, the loggers. And that was pretty scary because, you know, you, you start questioning all your life choices, like, what am I doing here? But then you remember that you have a purpose and what your mission is and that it's important to tell this story. And yeah, it can be risky, but it's worth it in the end. Yeah. Steve Irwin, who is my childhood hero, talked mm -hmm. about the fact that he was never scared of wildlife. Wildlife is stuff that you can understand and respect. And if you're in a position where wildlife has hurt you, it's probably your fault. Exactly. Whereas the people, it's always people are the, the wild card anywhere you're traveling in the world. And this is something we've heard echoed by a lot of photographers and field biologists. So I'm really yes. glad you did that. Um, a biologist at Heart Tamara, thank you so, so much <laughs> for this lovely presentation. Gorgeous photographs. I really encourage our audience to check out your website, check out your social media pages, Instagram. You've got some really good stuff. Thanks. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Ms. Gabog's group, Ms. Brown, if you want to mm -hmm. unmute your mic, Ms. Crow's class. Join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. You're all in the broadcast, everyone. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the day.